Anyway, um, some people are going to be kind of joining us slowly here, but we did want to get started for the, the sake of time. Um, so my name is Chris. Uh, I'm you know driven in from Ottawa yesterday. I'm here to give a talk today on agile project management, uh, and specifically focusing on the Scrum methodology uh, part of Agile. This is actually a brand new talk for me. Um, I've given quite a few talks uh, at Drupal cons and camps um, all over North America. This one is um, a little bit close to the heart because it's part of the big transformation our company has been going through in the last year and a half. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking today actually hasn't necessarily been solved. I've got some of the answers and I can give you some guidance, but really what I wanted to talk to you about was why, uh, why is it that we selected Agile as our project management methodology? Um, why is it that we selected Scrum as our methodology, as our flavor of Agile? Um, what were some of the challenges we brought up for our company? And then, of course, also, what, are, uh, what is it that we've done to solve those challenges? And then also, what are the challenges we're still facing today? Because I'd love to get some dialogue um, from you guys as well, in terms of your thoughts and ways uh, even we can improve our company moving forward. Um, you know, before I kind of dive into things, um, I wanted to just get a quick uh, feel for who's in the room today. So, um, out of curiosity, uh, how many people here are from Montreal? Quite a few. And then Ottawa, Toronto. Yeah, perfect. Um, how many people here work um, in a project team or an agency that's kind of like zero to ten people? So kind of on the smaller team size. Perfect. And then kind of ten to thirty. And then 30 to 50, 50 plus, Perfect. great. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, uh, applies to any type of agency or any type of environment or team. Um, I'm from an agency, so again, I mentioned my name's Chris. I founded a Drupal agency in Ottawa about five, five and a half years ago. Um, we've learned a lot and I've learned a lot. Believe it or not, I didn't create an agency on purpose. <laughs> um, it's a funny story, but we created a really cool software platform on Drupal, and then the market and the world kind of told us over time, wow, you're really good at Drupal, can you do anything else with it? And then we've uh, evolved over the years, and today, um, you know, we do kind of brand and market ourselves as an agency. We're just over 30 people um, at Open, and the way that our company is structured is very, um, I, <laughs> um, the way that we're structured is that we have multiple development teams, or what we refer to as pods. Um, at the beginning, uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about our history, but we were not an agile company at the very beginning. Um, so we kind of evolved into it. And this talk is all about that transformation and what we learned. Um, okay, let's kind of move on. So today, our checklist, what is it that I want to cover today? So uh, we kind of talked about introductions a little bit. Um, I forgot to mention, so I am a uh, certified associate project manager from the PMI. Um, I'm also a Scrum Master and a product owner certified by the Scrum Alliance. And then, you know, just my experience over the last five and a half years uh, running open has allowed me to um, really learn from an operational level what's required to deliver products quickly and on time, uh, and what works and what doesn't. So I like to think my experience, uh, hopefully I can share some of that with you today. Um, out of curiosity, who here today is working in what they believe or know to be a, an agile environment? That's the, the project management flavor of choice. Perfect. Um, and is it Scrum, Kanban, any methodology in particular that you guys are using? You just throw it out there. Scrum. 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 Yeah, Scrum. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, and for those that aren't, um, I'm curious to learn what's going to stick. Uh, and you know, I think that for you, is it about learning how Agile will bring benefit to your team and your value, like the, the value? Like, what are you hoping to take away out of this? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, for, uh, for me, it's to see how, how you're doing it um, with, like, alongside Drupal, to right. see if there's any uh, yeah, I mean, like new things that we can tie together. Okay, awesome. Um, absolutely, and I'll make every effort I can to tie everything back. Um, I'm a super casual guy, so please don't uh, hesitate to throw questions out if something comes to the top of mind as we just kind of go through. Um, I wanted to start with the background on project management. Sometimes I feel like to truly understand something, you need to know where it came from. Um, I promise it's not going to be a long history lesson. It's going to be really quick and on the fly. But it just kind of shows us how we ended up where we are today, um, how Agile came to be developed in 2001, and then even where Agile is going in the future. Um, from there, 
I wanted to jump into the transformation to Agile itself. What did that look like at Open? Um, what were the challenges we faced? I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the actual kind of human aspect to Agile as well. You can't really adopt this project management uh, philosophy and way of thinking without considering the people because it's truly them that's going to make the change um, in the way that they work, in the way that they communicate. Um, and as you're going to learn, Agile really is about the people aspect um, before anything else. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a bit of Q&A. So, intros for good. History of project management. So, I sat back and I started thinking, well, why do we sit that we do project management in the first place? And then I thought about, well, why at Open do, uh, did we implement project management? And I took a, a thought back to when we were a smaller agency, when we were roughly eight people, I'd say we were four or five developers uh, and an equally small sales team, and we actually had no management style at all. Um, so we weren't waterfall, we weren't agile, we were nothing. We were literally just ad hoc, the client told us what to do, and that's what we did. And we actually survived for probably a year and a half, two years in that fashion, um, before we actually started asking the question, do we need a project manager and what value does it bring? And it was interesting because um, our decision to bring in a project manager initially um, was not necessarily even stemmed from the fact that I think most people would intuitively go to, which is, well, projects are running over budget or running over time. A lot of the work we were doing was smaller projects, we were a smaller agency, um, and it was much easier for us just in an initial discovery to kind of visualize everything start to finish, right? So we were still being successful, um, but what we did find was that as our projects grew, um, and as the market looked to us more and more, um, we were uh, leaned on for what I would consider to be more higher risk projects. Uh, higher risk, uh, bigger budgets, uh, more complex timelines. And then I started thinking, well, at the end of the day, project management for us became a strategic advantage. It was more about sales and better positioning in the market. If we had project management as a company, as an agency, we would actually do a much better job um, against our competitors of equal size because we could mitigate against these risks um, that the bigger market was asking for. And oh, on, uh, beyond that, our projects, uh, that risk would be mitigated and then project budgets and timelines would also be resolved, any issues around that. So it was actually uh, a really kind of evolution, but it was all kind of stemmed from this strategic marketing perspective. And that, I think, is going to actually, uh, did play significantly into our decision to switch to Agile uh, later on down the road. So, um, so I talked about it a little bit. We've got a high risk sector. In web development especially, I would consider this extremely high risk compared to some others. What I've learned from the market is that often we're sitting down with clients and in those initial kind of pre-discovery meetings, what we're finding out is that often the scope of our projects is extremely broad. Um, our clients aren't sitting down talking to us saying, here are our 5,000 specifications, we'd like you to build them, um, which is kind of the old traditional waterfall style and where there's complete clarity in terms of what we're expected to do as engineers and developers. But instead, we're meeting with organizations where their understanding of what they're trying to accomplish is clear from a vision or from an obje objective standpoint, but not necessarily an understanding of how to translate that into technical requirements. Um, and for me, that's one of the big telltale, telltale signs of a, a high-risk project is that there's no actual clearly defined scope. It's something that a business analyst or uh, you know, a product owner is going to have to help them uh, discover throughout a process. So I did write down a couple facts. I hate reading your presentations, but I can't memorize facts like this. So in May 2010, uh, the Economist <coughs> Intelligence Unit Report, I like to believe that 2010 data is still relevant today. So sorry for that. <laughs> um, it said that project management would decrease failed projects by 31%. It was successful in delivering 30% uh, of projects under budget. It demonstrated a 21% improvement in productivity, 19% of projects ahead of schedule, and it was saving companies on average roughly $565,000 US every year. And I'm not even just talking about Agile, I'm just talking about going from no project management to project manage it, uh, management uh, today. Is anyone in the room in kind of a situation where you're working on a team when there is no project management? Yeah, perfect. 567,000 US <laughs> every year. I think um, the reason I brought that up, and I think sometimes I make the assumption, I take for granted, I think that everyone has a project manager, but it's actually true that most, I'd say almost half the people I talk to, there is no PM in their, in their workplace. It's, uh, rather interesting. Okay. Um, the end of my kind of history lesson here, I wanted to talk about the evolution of project management, where it all started. So in 1917, uh, that's when we saw the first Gantt chart. 1917, 
was World War I. Uh, I don't know if you guys know the, the history of the Gantt chart or uh, the water flow method, but it all stemmed to how do we get resources efficiently and effectively to the, the troops in the field. Um, that is the methodology that we still see being used in most agencies today as waterfall. And it was developed before computers, it was developed before most people had cars, it was developed for getting rations to the troops in the field. The Gantt chart and waterfall came from 1917, it's dated, is what I'm trying to get at. In 1957, we started to see uh, bigger improvements. Uh, there was a methodology called the critical path method. Um, what we did was we looked at, not we, I was bigger, but what people did was they looked at uh, what are the elements or tasks that need to be completed in a project, the critical path, assign some estimates to it, and that would be the way that we would schedule our project timelines and budgets, and everything else was extra. So very much, I like to think of it as an MVP or a minimal viable uh, product kind of model. Um, around the same time, we had something called PERT, P-E-R-T. Anyone heard of that one? U.S. Navy kind of stuff. Um, more about uh, estimation of all tasks. So up front, grabbing all these estimates and giving a best guess, and then from there, trying to plan things forward. That was the best we got. And then in 1965, the Europeans came out with a new certification. For the first time, project management was considered an actual job. Uh, so we have the International Project Management Association, the IPMA, uh, stemming out of Vienna in 65. And then uh, Americans following kind of shortly after, as they always do, in 1969. That's when the PMI came out, the Project Management Institute, for those that uh, didn't know. So they've been around a long time as well with their own methodology. And essentially the PMBOK, which is our rule book as project managers, on uh, all the different things uh, in terms of quality assurance, risk management, scheduling. They really do define project management uh, to a T in that book and all the things that we need to be considering. Um, in 1975 is when we started realizing computer project management and software development is different than traditional project management. They come up with these other uh, types of methodologies, one called Prompt2. Um, it later got uh, rolled into something called Prince. You guys heard of Prince before? No? Prince2, maybe? Prince completely failed, um, so they rebranded it significantly, called themselves Prince2, now it's widely popular. <laughs> um, it's a specific project management methodology for uh, IT development. It's actually really popular. I was at Environment Canada, our entire department aligned with Prince2. Um, kind of an alternative is ITIL, you might have heard of that one uh, as well. In 84, they came up with a theory of constraints. They started saying, well, we need to start managing the constraints, the budget and the timeline in projects. Um, and then from there, trying to focus on removing constraints. What I'm hoping to do is that you guys are pulling little pieces out of this and you're like, oh, that's where I thought came from. Um, the theory of constraints that every day, every week, we need to start saying, in our project, what are the constraints that we're experiencing? And we need to actively remove them to reduce the risk in our projects. In 1986, we had Scrum, or at least the first iteration of Scrum. Uh, people started thinking in software, we need to be smaller teams, it's more effective and we need to work in iterations and we need to get moving quickly uh, in that kind of way. But it actually wasn't until 2001 um, when a lot of people started really getting frustrated with the fact that we simply did not have an effective way of managing uh, software development projects that a group of 12 guys all got together at a ski resort in Utah <laughs> uh, and they sat down and they brainstormed and they came up with this uh, document that they call the Agile Manifesto, which I'm sure a few of you have heard of it before. Um, and then they came up with the values of Agile um, and that, that manifesto, that thing that they did on their 70 vacation in Utah, is what actually laid the framework for Scrum, Kanban, uh, extreme programming, and a lot of these other agile-based methodologies that we're using today. Um, and then, you know, they were born. Um, I'm not going to, ooh, sorry, I do have notes on. I'm not going to dive too deeply into the manifesto, but if you are considering moving into an agile um, frame set, or if that's the direction you want to take your project management in your organization, what I would recommend is actually just taking a quick read at it. There are four key values, there are 12, uh, 12 principles, and what you're going to find is that it's really just highlighting a couple key points. Um, one of them is that it's a real people-based process. Agile is about collaboration, it's about talking uh, to each other, it's about solving problems, it's about removing constraints, like the theory of constraints we talked about, um, and removing those impediments and so on. The other aspect of it is iterations. So what you're gonna learn in the Agile Manifesto is that it's about showing value um, quickly and often and trying to minimize the amount of work you're doing that's actually providing no direct value to your client at all. Um, so those types of principles we see um, integrated really well into the methodologies like Scrum um, you know, and Kanban and the rest. Today we're gonna to focus on Scrum, that's what our, Agile, uh, what our Agile teams have decided to align to as well. Um, 
But let me take a step back and talk specifically about open. Um, so for the first three years, I mean, at the beginning we didn't have project management at all, and then we brought in a project manager. We were actually eight guys, we were eight developers and sales pros, um, and then the first PM was a woman. <laughs> so she was a very brave woman that came in to uh, kind of put us all to work. And I remember our team was really hesitant to even bring a manager into our company um, because they thought, oh my god, my job, my little startup is going to feel like work now. Great. <laughs> so um, the project manager started for us. And the methodology we brought into place at the beginning was, you know, at the end of the day, waterfall. Um, when I really take a step back and think of it, um, it was waterfall, but we did go out to the market and promote it as waterfall. Everyone knew waterfall was terrible. Waterfall, of course, is this project management framework that's very sequential. Uh, you phase out your project. So at the beginning, you'll do discovery, then you'll move into a design phase. Then you'll go into development, which might be built into kind of uh, initiation. Then you'll go into your, in Drupal speak, your content types, your content structure, maybe your theming layer, maybe some integration work. And everything is completely stacked and sequential. And what it does is it creates a system of constraints. The pr next step cannot happen until the previous step happens, and the previous step before that can't happen. Um, and then you waterfall through this phase-based approach while managing your Gantt chart, your budgets, your timeline, and so on. And then inevitably you get to the end of the project and you realize one of those constraints, whether it be time or uh, budget, has run out and you're not done the last phase. And because that last phase is so significant, it could literally be the go live phase. It could be the phase where you actually deploy your work or maybe um, you didn't even get that far and it's the uh, business integration phase. Um, so all those business integrations that were really important to your client got postponed to the end because they were complex. Well, they're going to get cut out of this project now because we don't have the time or the budget to deliver. So this waterfall approach is kind of where we started when we started uh, onboarding our own project management. Um, but then we kind of tricked ourselves in a way. We said, okay, well, looking at the actual definition of agile, we said that, well, maybe we are agile, right? Okay, sure, we've got this phase approach and everything's completely stacked and constrained. But we were going to the market and we were saying, well, we're an agile company. We're going to report to you on a weekly basis. You're going to have insight into all of the, the decision making and you're going to have a say in this process. So it's hyper collaborative, hyper transparent. Um, but at the end of the day, the way that we had structured the projects um, was not um, in, an, in, that, in an agile way. It didn't align with the manifesto. Um, and we were tricking ourselves. And then sometimes we'd throw these terms at there. Anyone ever heard the term? Or anyone use the term water scrum? No? I've used that one. <laughs> I've used that one. I'm in sales. <laughs> water scrum fall? You use that one? No? That's my favorite, water scrum fall. It means that we think we're doing agile. We think we were doing agile, but everything's in a phase. And there's a whole bunch of constraints, and by the end of this project, we're probably going to blow the timeline budget. We don't say the last part in the sales pitch, but we do say the water scrum fall part to make it sound like we have a relatively like, well understood idea of what it is that we were going to deliver. So we were waterfall. Um, and then we were hitting uh, major issues um, and so on. Sorry, this is the manifesto. Um, I'm going to script that. We talked through it a little bit. So we're hitting these major roadblocks. Projects were becoming more complex for us. Our deal sizes were growing. Our clients were leaning on us more and more. Um, the teams were getting, um, it was becoming harder to work with. One of the things that I didn't mention about Waterfall is that because you have phases, it typically means you have specialists at every phase, like you have your themers, you have your content builders, or not content builders, you have your uh, content type builders, uh, you have the guys that are really good at infrastructure and DevOps, and you lean on them, you lean on them so heavily, and then if any of them go missing or leave your company or are sick, the entire phase is shot. Um, so it really, uh, the waterfall model for us created a bunch of specialists as well, created a lot of issues. Our projects were getting more complex, but we were not getting smarter, um, and then they were failing. So. Um, that's when we had to take a big step back as a company. In one year we had two failed projects. I took a big step back as well and I said we need to fundamentally change the way that we're managing our projects. We need to consider this agile thing everyone is talking about and perhaps take it seriously for the first time and see if it solves our problems. Um, and then from there we kind of really dove into it head first. Um, I mentioned that we're currently adopting Scrum. Scrum is one methodology of agile, right? We had just mentioned that. And Scrum is all about small teams, iterative development. You can choose your iteration length. It's either two, three, or four weeks, usually. Um, you typically don't go more or less than that. Uh, your team size is usually between five to 10 people. Um, the teams consist of a product uh, owner. So it's kind of like your Steve Jobs. It's your visionary. He owns the backlog, which is a term we'll talk about in a bit. But your backlog is a list of all the requirements that you need to do. 
that product owner is also meant to understand the vision and the strategy of the organization that we're serving, and then prioritize that backlog, backlog all the time and change the order of it to make sure that the backlog is always delivering the maximum value. Um, and then he's also meant to provide clarity to the developers on these tasks and these requirements to make sure that they are building um, the right product at the right time. Um, we have a Scrum Master, that's your facilitator in Scrum. Um, your Scrum Master is the one that sets up the meeting to make sure that Scrum is uh, working out really well. Um, sometimes if there's an impediment, a Scrum Master will actually go out and uh, try to mitigate that impediment. Um, and it's truly the facilitator of the entire process. And then you have your development team, and that's really the third group. And that team varies in size, ours is four. Um, and we've kind of mapped that to be our most effective size for a development team. And they're truly kind of this autonomous unit that's meant to uh, be self-organizing and do all the work on their own um, and to fulfill the objectives of the product owner and what they've set out. So um, the other thing to mention is uh, ceremonies. And it's the last point I want to mention about Scrum. And then we're really just going to dive into the challenges and the value learned. Um, in Scrum, we have set ceremonies or meetings. We call them uh, backlog refinement, where we're actually looking at the requirements and we're diving into them in detail and trying to determine what technical tasks need to be accomplished and how long will they take. Uh, so estimation, right? Um, we've got sprint planning, where we decide how much work we can accomplish in the next sprint. We have sprint review, where we bring the clients in and we actually look at the work that was completed um, and we collect feedback from the clients as well. And then we have sprint retrospective, which I'm gonna come back to a few times. The retrospective is an internal meeting where it's meant to be kind of closed door, open dialogue about where did we go right, where did we go wrong, and how do we get better um, at the end of the day. I forgot to mention that part of the Agile Manifesto is the idea of learning constantly and self-improvement. Um, Agile is not something that you just turn on tomorrow and it just starts working. It's like a one to two year kind of process before your team even becomes fully formed and effective. It's quite the, the investment, but well worth it. So. Do you guys have any questions about Scrum, Agile, Waterfall? No? It's a good pace. Oh, it's not, okay. <laughs> okay, let's dive into the challenges then. So I want to switch gears. I want to talk about when we decided to switch to Agile, what is it that we had to go through? And then hopefully from there, if any of these challenges resonate with you, you'll be able to pick up from what we learned and how we overcame them, and just grab a handful of ideas and bring it back to your workplace. The first big challenge was commitment. So. When we um, looked at adopting Scrum internally, what we said was we needed uh, both bottom-up and top-down commitment. So bottom-up, meaning all the managers in the company um, had to understand, and our executives, our directors, had to understand the amount of time and investment that this was going to take and the amount of risk it was going to bring into our organization uh, as well. We had known that this transformation was going to take one to two years before we were fully immersed into this agile methodology and had kind of ironed out all the kinks. I'd say we're about a year and a half in right now, so still ironing. <laughs> um, and then from there, um, what it would take in terms of an investment. So from a bottom up, so talk, or sorry, from a top down, so getting the managers in line, what we ended up doing, because they weren't sold on this right away, they said massive investment, it's gonna change the way that we fundamentally work, we have active clients um, that are going to think that this is going to be a crazy transformation, it's never gonna work out well for them. Um, it was a harder sell from top down, but what we did was we brought in external thought leaders. So usually every city has a, uh, an Agile or a Scrum community. Um, you can lean on them. They're very friendly people here in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, everywhere. You can lean on them. They'll even come in to present to your company or your team um, about the value of Scrum and try to, or Agile, sorry, and try to onboard you into the process and kind of walk you through all the different value add. And then usually they're actually a really good sounding board because what I found was our managers started just saying, oh my God, these are all the problems we have with our current way of doing things. And then they were able to address them um, using the Agile methodology to help us uh, clearly understand. They also can paint a roadmap. So we call them Agile coaches, but they help paint a roadmap for the actual adoption of Agile. Um, so if you can, I would recommend um, during the transition bringing a coach in and having them work with your management team um, to really kind of nail things down in terms of a plan um, and next steps. The other is that from a training perspective, Agile training is not a cheap uh, investment by any means. I think in our case, it costs probably roughly 20 or $30,000 to bring in a coach for a couple weeks um, to certify and teach our entire company. Um, a lot of the Canadian government, uh, provincial government will subsidize your training, so that might be something that you guys want to look into as well. But I do not recommend that you just kind of go into this process completely 
um, blind and kind of figure it out on your own, I recommend finding a mentor, finding a coach, and having them guide you through it. Now on the other side, we also have the uh, bottom-up approach. So it's one thing to just have all your managers in line um, and telling you that we're going agile and we believe this is going to be great for your company, but from a bottom-up, you need to have your developers actually uh, bought into the idea as well because they're the ones that are going to do the work itself. So, so from a bottom-up, what we did internally was we structured a conversation with all the developers to explain to them the value proposition, how things were going to change, what these changes were going to look like, and to answer their questions with full transparency. I told you we'd be talking a lot about change management. This is just one of the things you can do early, early on uh, when adopting Agile to really make sure that your entire company is on board. Because if you have them on board, all the changes that are about to follow um, are going to come uh, much, much easier. The second challenge I wanted to talk about was cross-functionality. Um, kind of at a show of hands, do people here have specialists within their company? People that they assign specific tasks to all the time? Like your migration guy, yeah, your themer, whatever it might be. Agile and Scrum specifically really do away with that concept of resource assignment and specialization. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get us and promote us into the idea that the entire development team has a well-rounded skill set and can pick up any task at any time. So if the highest priority maximum value task for that client is a migration related task and the team is not aware of any of their migration skill or only one specialist has it and he's on vacation, the next person in that team needs to be able to pick up the task and do that work. You can't skip down the priority list and start working on something that is not the highest priority because it's completely against the principle that we're trying to do the most maximum value for our clients as possible. To do that, you have to be cross-functional. It's very hard. Um, usually when you bring on a new developer, they have a skill set already. They're HTML programmers, they're CSS or JavaScript. They might be Java engineers and very uh, heavy into the back end. And they already have a very good uh, aptitude in a certain area. And then all of a sudden you need to work with them to make them more generalist so that you can lean on them to do other tasks based on the priorities and the backlog that come up. Um, and also create redundancy within the team like I was mentioning when there's vacations, sick days, and employee leaves and so on. So cross-functionality for us is something that we're actively working on today. Uh, some of the ways that we're addressing it as an agency is one, we're investing a lot in training. Um, we're bringing in engineers to help teach the people that are not as familiar so that they're the goal is not to make everyone a generalist, but it's to increase the depth in all areas equally. So we bring in these experts to teach the entire team the same skill set. We don't just focus on, uh, for our back-end developers, bringing in you know, object-oriented programmers to teach them. Everyone is uh, responsible for learning how to be a coder, a tester, a front-end themer, and the rest. The other things we do are pair programming. So pair programming is when you're actually sitting down working on tasks side by side. So if you do have your migration specialist and no one else on your team knows migration, the next time that that comes up, you sit down and you do pair programming and you have two people work on it. So one person is constantly learning and the other person is uh, kind of in a teacher mentor role at that point. Um, the differences in your knowledge uh, in between team members is something that we're fundamentally, not fundamentally, but constantly struggling with. We're looking to, to kind of walk away from the idea of one specialist. Um, but those are definitely two ways that we've accomplished it. Um, the third thing is that uh, about four or five months ago, we introduced the concept of a secondary competency. Everyone that was a specialist in site building or uh, module development or whatnot, we encouraged them to then pick up a second competency that was not related to what they were doing today. So if you're a developer, um, we'd encourage you to pick up maybe a user experience certification, right? Um, so that you become more acutely aware of things like audiences and business objectives and the rest. So developing your cross-functional team is one of the core challenges that we face um, in our Agile, and it's something that we're pushing against uh, day and day. Business know-how is a tricky one as well. I think that we spend a lot of time teaching the business know-how, like understanding the market, understanding the industry to our salespeople. We probably spend a lot of time teaching our account managers. These are the people that are going to market every day and representing our companies. They're the executives in our teams that are explaining what we're doing. Uh, but from a business and uh, a strategic standpoint, but our developers and our project managers and our product owners, they don't necessarily have the same business know-how. They're not exposed to these types of conversations every day. However, because Scrum and Agile are so based around prioritization and maximizing business value for your client during every iteration, to have business know-how across the entire team is fundamentally important to make sure that we understand what are they trying to accomplish and make sure we're delivering the right thing. So business know-how and how do we develop that internally? So one of them, we have a product owner, as I mentioned, on the team. That PO's job is to understand the vision and the strategic uh, goals of the project. 
That product owner is constantly reinforcing and sharing that message with the entire development team. That's definitely one thing that we're doing all the time to make sure that when we're coming up with a technical solution, we're always saying, does it solve the actual business problem that we're looking to? Um, the other thing that we do, and not everyone uh, agrees with this, but I agree with it, so I'm going to present it. Um, we include our development team in all the meetings. So your development team, you know, is six people. To put them into a discovery session for an entire day can be extremely time consuming and costly for your clients. But at the end of the day, if they understand the business strategy and the objectives, the value that that time is gonna bring is much greater than the value if we have to do a handoff or deal with the mistakes that they make down the road because they've been working on something that was a miss from a business objective standpoint all along. So we bring as many people as we can into these meetings so that the information is heard directly from client um, to developer and the rest of the team, so it's uh, clear as uh, clear as what ice water, not mud, <laughs> um, and that's a big one. And then again, the pair programming is just again a really cool technique that we use to make sure that knowledge is constantly transferred within our team. Our guys work usually mostly in pairs, um, and then sometimes only when they need to be distraction free, they'll work with the headphones on and uh, not paying attention to anyone else. So learning. So tomorrow I'm giving a big presentation on the culture of learning. So that's how you're gonna solve this problem. But if your organization does not have a culture of learning, which you know I'm gonna present is this idea or concept that within your team, um, learning is woven into the, the actual strategic objectives that you're constantly pushing your understanding and your innovation, your know-how. Um, if that is not something that every day your employees are challenging themselves, chances are you're not gonna be able to maximize um, on the technical solutions um, that uh, you're offering your clients, chances are that you're never gonna hit that cross-functionality that you're hoping to achieve. So tomorrow I've got a big presentation on this called the culture of learning, uh, similar style kind of business talk, um, but yeah, it's gonna really get into how is it that we enable people and our teammates to learn, uh, to be constantly learning um, and uh, more effective at their jobs. The role change. So I'm assuming that you're already working in a team environment, and if you are like us and like we were, the actual job role change is a significant challenge. Um, you have people that were employed to do one job and chances are they're not gonna be doing that job once Agile uh, converts. Developers will always be developers, but they're not specialists anymore, they're cross-functional. So our front-end themers were like, whoa, 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 you want me to write what module now, right? And our uh, technical leads, we had these senior people that were responsible for the end delivery of products were no longer even in existence. The whole role disappeared in our company um, so we no longer had senior, intermediate, or juniors, and we didn't have technical leads who could bear all the weight of accountability of delivery. The development team itself, this cross-functional team, was fully accountable for the delivery as a joint group. Um, so that was a complete kind of mind shift as well. Um, and then the disappearing role change meant that people um, that were tech leads had to find other homes within the company, either as developers on the development team, or some of them transitioned to become product owners. And then you don't necessarily have a project manager, although this is a bit of a tweak that we do in our company. Uh, we do have a project manager, but that PM also took on the role of Scrum Master. Um, you guys can ask me questions about why we have a PM later if you want, but it's really stemming around the idea that our clients have told us they need the communication, they need someone managing the budget and timeline and the constraints for them. Um, and that's why we've modified Scrum to include one. But our PM is a Scrum Master as well, so the project manager's job changed too to also include the facilitation and discussion and removal of impediments um, from a day to day. So we've got these three brand new job roles and within our company everyone had to be restructured. Um, it was a tricky process, it took us about a month, but what we did was we basically listed out everything that everyone did in their job role and we mapped it to the new job title and the new responsibilities. We then went from there, we prioritized everything so that everyone had a clear understanding of what they should be focused on on the day to day and when they had time, uh, the things that they could deal with off the corner of their desk. Um, communication was extremely paramount in this entire initiative. Um, it's not every day that you tell someone, sorry, your job is completely changed um, and your expectations are completely changed. So communicating to them those changes and answering their questions is again uh, kind of at the, the heart of this. Something we're struggling with today is, I mentioned, we lost the accountability of the technical lead. Um, I was in meetings earlier this week where uh, we're saying there's a void, Chris. Uh, people are telling me there's a void, Chris. Um, in our company, we used to have this technical lead that would actually ensure that the tasks were being delivered exactly the way that we wanted them to. They were the senior role. They were providing guidance to the team. Um, they were telling them basically how to solve these challenges. 
Um, so we're working on that void right now. I'd love to hear kind of um, suggestions or ideas from anyone that's doing Agile today, how they've managed to implement a fully cross-functional team, um, and then develop a, a culture where you know four or five developers truly feel accountable as one, uh, rather than having to feel no accountability at all, right? Um, which is something that groups of people tend to do. And then the last kind of human aspect that I want to touch on was trust. So when developing, <coughs> or when rolling out Agile, it became, uh, there became a few new exercises, like the sprint retrospective, which is this one ceremony we're meant to do every two weeks through closed doors, where the team will actually talk about everything that went wrong in front of their managers, in front of the people, in front of the product owner, in front of the PM who's responsible for budget and time constraints. And it's meant to be this big, healthy, constructive kind of criticism dialogue that usually lasts for several hours on where do we go wrong and how is it that we're going to improve it moving forward. It actually ties really well back into learning because what it does is it typically helps us develop our learning plans over the next two weeks in areas that we need to focus on. But it all stems to trust. Uh, we had a terrible situation, I'd say like six months ago, where uh, we blew up the sprint. And in blowing up that sprint, our project manager freaked, as PMs can do sometimes, right? Um, and came into the retrospective, into this trust, the circle of trust that we established, and basically just said, I can't believe you guys would even let it get this bad, right? Like we hit like 33% of our deliverables or something in the spring. It just did not go um, well at all. And it was negative reinforcement and negative reinforcement and pushing and pushing and everyone felt terrible, but beyond feeling terrible from the negative reinforcement that the manager put on the team, um, the trust was broken. They did not feel that they were open to actually discuss the problems in retrospective anymore. So what we did was we said, okay, well, you have the option as a team if you want your project manager to be part of that retrospective. And for the next two or three months, uh, it didn't happen. And we actually had to do a bit of an apology. The PM had to come in and say, you know, I'm sorry for uh, breaking your trust and kind of holding you accountable in that way. Um, I understand this is meant to be an open dialogue and a safe zone, right? It really was exactly what retro was not meant to be. This happens a lot. Retro is not about he did or she did. It's meant to be what can we do to get better tomorrow. And all of that stems around trust. I'm happy to say that both teams are you know, very open in retro right now. We've kind of gotten over that hurdle. Um, but just be wary of, uh, wary of negative reinforcement and the implications it can have. And then if you can lean on positive reinforcement and constructive criticism, it's much better aligned with Agile, with the manifesto, and the principles that are behind it. A lot of what I've been talking about is agile from a human, like a change management perspective. Talking with the people, talking about their jobs, because that's what agile uh, is going to change the most within your organization. But now I want to talk about the framework itself and talk about some of the things that have presented challenges. That have presented challenges for us. One of them was the backlog. So a backlog is your list of requirements that you need to accomplish. One of the challenges as a smaller agency of 30 some people is that we can't afford the luxury of just working with one client per team. Um, we have to take on two or three simultaneous projects at any given time, which means that every client has their own list of requirements and they have their own business value and their own priorities. However, Agile and Scrum um, really come down to just having one single backlog. Everything per team is meant to be uh, aggregated together and then we're meant to be able to prioritize our tasks um, you know, across not just uh, multiple, um, you know, epics or uh, features, but also across multiple uh, clients as well. So we had a huge challenge around backlog, um, but what we did was we did persist um, through it and we did experiment with different ways of prioritizing your backlog with multiple clients. And what we found is it really does require a lot of collaboration with your project manager, the person who's kind of communicating with the client a lot. Uh, in terms of constraints, your product owner, who understands the business value, um, and then between the two of them, they need to strategically align your uh, backlog, your one single backlog, um, you know, so that uh, the team can then begin working on tasks uh, in order of proper priority. So uh, my one recommendation in terms of backlog is make sure not to fall victim of maintaining several different backlogs for all your different clients. Um, you'll never be able to establish a self-organizing team where they come to work and they literally just take the first task off the backlog and uh, start working. The other um, kind of framework item that we brought in was an idea called Stories. Um, stories is not part of Agile, it's not part of Scrum. It's actually just an interesting way of doing requirement gathering when a project has a very broad scope. I have yet to see the web RFP today that did not have a broad scope. Like, you know, I was talking about the, all the specifications that I want. Most people are asking us to solve business problems. 
uh, to help them reach their vision, and therefore they don't have a well-articulated idea in terms of what the technical solution will look like. So stories is this great tool for requirement gathering where you're actually able to work with the client and say, what is your requirement in business speak? There's a, a small kind of nuance, it's a technique, it's got a framework uh, to it. A story is meant to say, who is the audience? So like for John, the you know content editor, um, it has to be able to do something. He must be able to uh, edit you know, publications or articles uh, easily. And then what the value it is uh, that gives it to John so that John can do his job in a timely way. So a story really comes down to audience, what they need to do and what value it brings them. And it's really very much high level business speak. But these stories are really um, the key step that we've brought in to help us transition from broad scope and then we can bring a story into a development team and say, okay, this is the business objective. Let's talk about what are all the technical solutions for achieving this. So it actually gives your technical uh, engineers and your product owner and the team the flexibility they need to come up with the best technical solution to hit the end business objective. Um, instead of telling them, I want a map that displays points or something like that. That is more of a, a set specific feature requirement and it's exactly the opposite of what we try to do. Stories, high level business value, well articulated uh, kind of requirements that through refinement we then break down into technical tasks internally and we're the ones that come up with the technical solution that best uh, solves that need. So stories, something that we added to Scrum that we love um, for kind of the business analyst and transformation uh, of requirements into solutions. The next point is prioritization. So often in meetings, I get asked the question of, Chris, how are you gonna guarantee that at the end of this project budget or timeline that we're gonna be happy with our deliverable or we're gonna get everything we want is actually even a better question, right? And it all, for me, comes back to prioritization. Being able to say with confidence that every two weeks, we're gonna look at your priority backlog and make sure that the highest priority items, the things that make the most maximum uh, business value for your organization are what we're gonna work on next. And then we're going to sequentially work through that list until the end of the budget or timeline, right, until we launch this thing. Um, and then at the end of the day, at the bottom of your backlog are going to be features that you never really cared about anyways. They had very low business value um, to your organization. So prioritization for us was uh, a challenge because what it does is a lot of um, clients, they're constantly saying, well, we want it all, we want it all, we want it all. And we had to get um, the understanding across during our discussions that in this um, methodology, the scope of your project is truly flexible, we're going to deliver on time, we're going to deliver on budget, but to do so we need to prioritize uh, your scope, your backlog, and then at the end of that budget when everything is kind of depleted and run out, you're going to be so happy because we've maximized value for the constraints that you had in the project. At the end of the day, everyone has an unlimited number of requirements. I'm sure you guys can all agree with that. Everyone wants a website and they have an unlimited number of requirements. And if you ask them, what do you want? They'll tell you they want the next Amazon or something, right? For their e-commerce store. Um, so we prioritize, we maximize business value, um, but we, you need to be able to articulate that clearly to your clients. Two more framework things, one more um, point on software, and then I'll take a few questions. So estimates. Um, estimation is a problem that project managers and product teams have every day. Um, estimates are wildly inaccurate. Early estimates are even worse than later on uh, estimates, of course. And then estimates are what allow us to tell our clients with confidence that um, we're going to deliver their project on time and on budget. It's meant to provide clarity. Um, and quite honestly, if I could do projects without estimates, if we could just have clients that said, you know what, we have a good trusting relationship, just deliver what you can. That would be great, right? <laughs> that would be the ideal. But instead, we need to create early estimates in sales. We need to create estimates later on during refinement. Estimates create a lot of issues. All you can do is try to do your best to bring accuracy to your estimates, but understand that they'll never be perfect and that you'll have to mitigate against them down the road. What we do is we lean on a couple things. Our estimates have gotten better because our teams are more and more cross-functional every day. So if more and more people in the room understand that complex migration, then it's going to be much easier for everyone to ask the important questions when we're coming up with a consensus on the estimate um, about where there could be potential hurdles, how much time it's going to take. So our estimate session would look like five, four to five people sitting in a room. Um, we would look at a technical task, we would have a discussion about what's required, and then we also play a game, it's like estimation poker. You guys might have heard of this before, but they're just with these cards with some numbers on it. Um, they, cards can represent uh, time, they can re represent story points, um, there's lots of different ways of playing, but you 
play this game and everyone votes. You kind of discuss what needs to get done and you vote on how much time it's going to take. Um, you flip your card over and then everyone has a discussion. Typically we say the highest and the lowest. What they do is they're going to talk together and they're going to say, well, this is why I think it's going to take a lot of time and the lowest says, this is why I think we're going to get it done real quick. Sometimes it helps you uh, realize a skill gap in your team. Uh, sometimes it helps you realize that you just didn't consider um, something in your estimate or your scoping, like you forgot about this one subtask or something you had to do. Um, so this kind of estimation for us has helped kind of narrow things down. We keep doing this game over and over again until we have consensus in the team. Um, so cross-functionality plus finding consensus allows us to improve the accuracy of estimates and they're still just estimates at the end of the day. But that's how we end up um, coming up with those. And again, if in an ideal, um, we would never have to give another estimate again because they truly are just that guesses. And the last point I want to talk about was the software itself. So everyone has their own flavor of software. Um, before switching into Agile, we were using Basecamp almost uh, exclusively for all of our communication. Every project had its own Basecamp list. You could easily drag and drop tasks up and down. So like there was simple prioritization. But what we found was that um, Basecamp did not allow us to create a single backlog. It never gave us the visibility across all of our projects simultaneously um, that we needed to do that or to report on the well-being of the team or the company. So we said if we're going to mature our project management process, we need to mature our tools as well. So we tried Trello. Trello was crap. Um, too simple. Sorry, it's not crap. It's a great tool. At last, we just bought it. Trello was a great tool, but for what we're trying to do, um, it was too simple. We still couldn't get an aggregated view across all uh, projects we were uh, doing simultaneously. Um, we ended up going with a lot of hesitation to Jira. Anyone rolling their eyes right now? Sighing. Yeah. Jira is uh, can be. Jira has a bigger learning curve than Drupal does. We'll put it that way. Um, I recommend that if you're going to move into Jira, that you spend the, the money on the pre-recorded videos. They're actually pretty good. And get everyone that needs to use Jira fully trained. And if you want, even certified on Jira. That way you know that the material is sticking. But for us, we've ended up aggregating all of our software and communication into Jira. At last year, it's great. Uh, got great tools like Confluence and so on that all work hand in hand. But the benefit of doing so is now we can actually create a single backlog for an entire team. Um, we can still maintain backlogs for our clients independently as well. So we have all these independent backlogs. We roll them up into one. It gives us a complete uh, vision of how the team is progressing. And we can actually calculate analytics and metrics in terms of our efficiency of a team. And we can uh, look to see some of those uh, KPIs that Agile is meant to help us improve on throughput and the rest. So Jira, absolutely. Huge lesson learned. We didn't invest in training right away. Six months of headaches, a lot of complaining. We purchased thousands of dollars in videos. We had the whole team go through the process night and day. Always invest in training in big transformations like this. It's just going to save you all the additional costs of um, you know trying to figure it out the hard way. So, and that's where we went for software. So Q and A. I'd love to take questions. Transforming Agile is a very complex thing, and everyone does it differently. So. I'd love to know if anyone has any questions or how yeah. do you spell Jira? Oh, sorry. How do you spell Jira? J I R A. Yep. How do you make a team, the entire team, completely responsible for a project instead of the PM or the team? That's a great. And that's actually my question from earlier to you. Salary <laughs> or okay. anything like into the role, the salary, and yeah. the expectation that you can have. So. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of steps out of Agile a little bit, to, but I'm happy to explain kind of how our uh, model works at Open. So we have a number, like a salary number, for example, uh, and a model for how every team needs to operate financially. We know how much we can afford from a, an annual budget per team. Um, and in doing so, that uh, allows me to give autonomy to product managers and, uh, or sorry, product owners and project managers to find their own resources, to interview and so on. So we just say this is kind of your salary cap for the year. And then we um, also provide them with a hiring process so that they know how to do onboarding properly um, as well. So it's kind of like how to do recruitment, how to do interviews, what are the important questions to ask. Um, our culture is very much around learning. Um, so for us, if we're interviewing someone um, and they don't demonstrate an ability to learn or a, a desire to continue learning, and that does happen quite a bit, you'd be surprised, um, you know, that's a red flag for us in that process. So around hiring, um, we try to push as much uh, autonomy to the team itself. In terms of taking accountability for the delivery itself, um, I think that that's something that we're still continuing to work on today, especially with the development team. 
They used to have a senior developer on every team and that person was accountable for the delivery, which meant that if on, on Friday night we had to go live on Monday, let's say, um, and something wasn't done, it usually fell on that person's shoulders to work the entire time. Um, we are working. It's really just a lot of communication at this point um, and trying to stress on the, the point that you know, our development team of five engineers, you need to be able to be, you need to be accountable for your work together. Um, and what we've been doing is monitoring in the retrospective, if they're asking questions or taking on challenges that are more uh, representative of trying to be more accountable as a unit, rather than, um, you know, as separate people saying, well, I thought you were dealing with that task, it's your fault kind of thing, right? So accountability for us is it's gonna be a behavior change, which means it takes a lot of time. We're kind of uh, constant communication in the right direction and then monitoring through retrospectives to see if we're, if we're making progress. That's only two of, I'm sure, a handful of things that we do, but yeah, some, some ideas. Yep. Yeah. How sorry. do you developers react when you told them they had to become cross functional? Um, okay, two reactions. Two reactions. Um, we had people that were really bored, um, site builders are not particularly excited to come to work in the morning. Um, so they were extremely happy. They were like, I'm gonna come to work and I'm gonna be challenged again. And I'm ta not talking people that have been doing site building for five years. I'm talking like one year new graduate bored at her job already. I remember one case just going for a lunch and she said, I'm just bored, this is not, uh, this is not what I envisioned. So they were very excited. So we had a handful of people that where waterfall and specialization was not working for them at all from a challenge perspective. And then we had a lot of people that were specialists and they were really hesitant to jump into something new because they had spent so much time and investment becoming the migration guy. And they felt a little bit like their job security depended on it, right? Um, but for us, you know, breaking through that again has been a bit of a behavior change. It's been about encouraging um, and supporting. You know, being able to give them buffer room on a task. If they say, you know, like, the team agrees that that task might take five hours, for example, you say, well, take a pair of programming, grab a, a specialist, and you take the lead and learn and have a mentor beside you. It might take a little bit longer, but that person will figure it out. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, just giving them more time to do a task overall so that they can learn uh, with support. Um, but yeah, I think mentorship is really important for those people because they're so set in their ways, they don't really want to um, go uh, another direction. Sorry, you had a question. Oh, I'm just uh, fired blasted by uh, the Agile method because I'm coming from a small collective where uh, 10 to 15 uh, people from the job firm, and uh, we're self-managed, uh, no uh, hierarchical uh, structure, it's uh, horizontal, we do everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, for sure there's some uh, specialization, but um, uh, the Agile uh, method worked very well for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the only, uh, I guess, one of the differences that, uh, that we have is that we don't have uh, per se a PM manager. We have like a scrum master, but uh, I can be a scrum master on a project and a dev on another. So mm -hmm. we tend to uh, interchange and uh, we have a small team, so we're not more than two or three. But uh, yeah, and we use red lines. To, um, red lines. For, yeah, mm -hmm. and maybe we're going to move to um, GitLab. I'm not sure, but uh, okay, that's really interesting. Because you're horizontal, agile just sounds like it's more of a natural fit because that's what it's all about, right? And the fact that you're even able to switch roles completely, I think, is cross-functional to a degree that I hope to get to one day. That you know, one day you're a developer, the next day you're a product owner. How amazing could that be? Um, for us, we still have a long way to go until that point. Um, yeah. But my point is that it works well for two. Uh, type of different organization. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess, the genius of this uh, method. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How are we doing? Okay, we're at the end of the session, I think. People are lining up. So thank you guys for coming to the talk. Really appreciate it. Um, if you're currently learning Drupal or want to learn more about Drupal, we have a booth, the open booth, uh, outside. We do free training sessions every month on Drupal 8, like really in-depth module development, <coughs> theme development, site building, and so on. It's meant to help you if you want to get certified down the road. You can go talk to Adam or Shannon. They're happy to take your name and then we'll start inviting you. It's exclusive. It's not something we do publicly, only to people that really attend uh, Drupal camps. Um, Drupal camps and you know, potential clients and so on. So I encourage you to go talk to them if you're looking to, to pick up Drupal. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs>